Please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. It's Philippians, the fourth chapter, beginning in the fourth verse. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, what is ever admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Please be seated. Gentlemen, arm yourselves. Put your arms at the side. This is a sermon that's going to be to fathers, and sometimes you can get that from the spouse. Right? None of this now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Our God loved us so much that he sent his son into the world to die for us. We are by his grace, adopted in, purchased again. To think about it, God had already created us. We were his possession from the beginning. And yet, he took the other step and now redeemed us by the precious blood of his son. When I think about that, I think if there's anything that we should do as Christians is to learn to find our joy in a God who gives and gives and gives and gives, whose grace is without measure, whose love never fails. We ought to find our joy exclusively in Christ. When the days of trouble come, it is ours to remember that he will never leave us or forsake us when we're enjoying those marvelous times of seasons of refreshment, when we catch that fresh breath of the Spirit and everything is going better than we anticipate, we ought to give thanks to God for his unfailing kindness toward us. For not only did he create a beautiful and wonderful world, but he gave us the opportunity to enjoy it, to inhabit it, to live in it, and then by his grace, to participate in it by giving thanks and glory to him for that which he has recreated, and then in Jesus Christ to give praise and honor to him for he has redeemed us and we are his, exclusively his. When you find your joy in Christ, it is because you recognize, first of all, that of all the people that have been created, of all the people that will be created, God poured into you something that will never be repeated again. You are exclusively you. You can't be anybody different, and if you're trying to be, stop it. Be that which God has created you to be, and when you find what it is that he has called you to do, whether that be butcher, baker, candlestick maker, whatever you do, do to the glory of God, and there you will find your purpose and joy. Don't do it for money. Don't do it for the praise of someone else. Don't do it because you think you have to. Don't do it because someone told you you should. Do it because you are absolutely convinced that the reason I have been created and redeemed is to further the cause of Jesus Christ in this place and among these people so that he receives the glory and they are blessed. 
That is where you find your joy in Jesus Christ. Rejoice in the Lord always, Paul says, and again I tell you to rejoice. He is in prison, folks. This is not a happy place to be. But it doesn't matter what's happened to me. The apostle knows that he has been called by Jesus Christ to be the apostle to the Gentiles, and that as he has proclaimed Jesus Christ, the reason he has been put in prison is so that he can further the cause of Jesus Christ and that he can extend Christ's glory in the world. And in that situation, he can rejoice. That's what I hope for each of you. You will find the place that God has put you and to rejoice. Fathers, your chief task in this world is to help your children find that place where their unique gifts are open to the leading of God's spirit and to the prompting of God's love. If you can help your children to discover what God is doing in them and what God wants of them, and you can help them to achieve it, you will have accomplished much. My son Caleb. Oh, my son Caleb. He said to me one time, Dad, I'm sorry I'm not the kid you wanted. I said, you're right. You're not the kid I wanted. I wanted somebody who loved the outdoors, who would hunt and fish with me, who would climb every mountain, you know, that kind of soar all the rivers. I, I wanted that kid. But somehow God equipped you to do music, and he equipped you to do acting, and you opened up worlds to me. If I got what I wanted, I would have missed it. I would have missed what God was doing in your life. So you're right. You're not the kid I wanted. Thank God you're the kid I got. Right? So fathers, that's your chief task. Help discover with them who Jesus Christ is calling them to be. And grandfathers, your day isn't over. And great-grandfathers, your day isn't over. It's your task to listen into that little life, into those growing lives, to hear what God has planted in them, what excites them, what thrills them, what is it that they get motivated by. Listen, some kids just love mud. You know, tell them to enjoy it. Tell them, get in there. You're not the parents. Tell them, get in there and make it as muddy as they can. We'll square it with your parents when we get home. That's the joy of grandparenting. But listen into their lives and discover who they are and what God is calling them to be. And as you listen in, you need to speak into their lives. You need to tell them, who's the God that made mud? It is God who created the heavens and the earth, and Jesus wants you to be up to your ears in mud. It makes him happy. Get in there. Why do we answer questions about why is the sky blue, Dad? Well, it's refraction, son. They'll get that in school. Because God likes blue. It makes you happy. Look at how much blue he's made. And he even threw it into the water. Isn't that amazing, son? Isn't that amazing, daughter? Do you realize within your hands... God has placed the soul, and so many daughters and so many sons need to know that they're valuable, they're worthy, they're loved because of who God has created them to be. And as a parent, it's because you recognize the work of God in their lives and you're willing to do whatever it takes to help them to succeed, to be that for which God has created them. Paul says the way we carry this out is in gentleness. We don't have to spur them on. We don't have to drive them. Oh, I coached Little League. 
What a terrible thing. Did you know there were parents who actually expected us to have a winning season? I told the girls when we started, playing softball, if you can have, if you can be dirty and have fun, we have succeeded. I don't care what the score is. I want you to enjoy the game of baseball and enjoy being a part of a team. Who cares about score when you're on the major leagues? Then maybe you worry about score. Come on, Red Sox. But you know, other than that, get dirty and have fun. Learn the game, learn how to play. Enjoy being in those positions, enjoy your time at bat, because soon it'll be over. Who cares about the score? Learn the game. The coaches used to get crazy at us because my girls were in that age where they were doing the cotton eye joke. That's how we warmed up. We brought down the boom box, put cotton eye joe on, and had the other team come in and do it. The other coaches were, well, we need to get them warmed up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's do cotton eye joke. Let your gentleness be seen, not as compliant, not as somehow complacent, but that you can trust that whatever storm your child is going through, whatever is happening in their lives, there is a God who is over all, above all, and in all. There is a God who you can trust at school and at home and at play, who has promised to do good to you, to those who are called according to his purpose. Put your trust in God. Let's not worry about it. We will work it out together. Ultimately, everything that we do can be worked out together. Don't become so anxious about something that you teach your children how to panic. And if I'm afraid of anything in this day and age is we have people running around, forgive me, like chickens with their head cut off and wonder why their children are having anxiety problems. They have not learned what we know, that by prayer and petition, we can make our requests known to God and we can trust that God who is for us will answer them according to his purpose and he will do what is best for us, even if we have to change our mind and learn to follow his will again and again and again. Be anxious about nothing, but in everything, by prayer and petition, make your request known. And it's then, and only then, that the peace of God, that transformative power of God that's taking us from being the messed up wrecks that we are into the very image of his son, transforming us, recreating us, making us whole again, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It goes beyond all understanding. And so you can say to your children, no matter what you're facing, to your grandchildren, whatever the situation and circumstances you were in, don't you dare worry about trying to figure it out on your own. You can't figure it out on your own, but you can trust that as you pray and as you make your requests known, God will figure it out with you and for you. Don't worry. Trust. Don't be anxious. Put your hope in Jesus Christ. Fathers, if there's anything that you can give your children, it's that steadfast belief that Jesus Christ is their assurance and he will never leave us or forsake us. Teach them that in your own life by your own example. Now, my dad's with me, so it's kind of hard for me to fill you in about my dad. But dad taught me to find my joy in Christ. Dad taught me that by prayer and petition, you can make your request to God be known and you can trust him in every situation. 
dad was always one who said to me, trust in God, he had that non-anxious presence. Now I have to tell you, one of the stories that you may find that kind of illustrates this. I was called to go to Wheaton College. I came out of a school where if I didn't say much and didn't be, misbehave much, I got good grades. And when I went to Wheaton College, all 50 states were represented and 52 countries in a student body of 2,000. The average SAT score back when it was 1,600 was 1,500, and I can tell you who brought the SAT scores down. And when dad came into town with me and dropped me off at school, he said this, good luck, trust in the Lord, you can do this, but if you decide this is not for you, it's 16-hour trip from Chicago to Scranton. Give me a couple of weeks and I'll be back for you. Well, that's a pretty good offer, isn't it? I could try it for two weeks. What could possibly go wrong? I knew that if it didn't work out, I'd have to call Dad and Dad would come get me. Be anxious about nothing. Pray. Trust the Lord's leading. And when I called Dad the first week and said to him, do you know how many books they expect me to read in this first quarter? Dad said, you can do it. Hang in there. The second thing that parents need to teach is what Paul gives as the grocery list. When you look at the Apostle Paul, he says... Whatever is true, we need to teach our kids the difference between what is true and what is false. What is that which has honesty and value to it? It's so easy to get the counterfeit, isn't it? But we need to be the people who trust that God has called us to authenticity. And you can be who you are, be true to your Father in heaven, be true to who God has called you to be. Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about these things. Where do you learn that? It's not on the internet. Where do you learn value? Where do you learn the difference between right and wrong? Where do you learn the things that you're to appreciate? Where do you catch that sense of what is noble and pure. Share with your grandchildren. Share with your children. Share with the great-grandchildren. Any event in life or anything that is high, that lifts them up, don't be afraid to point out a sunset by taking a minute and saying, wow. Don't be afraid to take those moments to show them the difference between a real car and a fake one. You know, the GTOs of the world. Show them the things that you value. Show them the things that have meaning to you. Show them the things that inspire you. Show them the things that the Lord our God has created. And when you talk to them, for example, and please forgive me, Allow them to hear sacred music that makes you think you've come into the very presence of God rather than something on a rock and roll stage. Help them to see the transcendent value of what is great. Now, there is good rock and roll as well, but help them to see the difference between the two and to give expression and give themselves to that which is noble, which is pure, which is excellent and praiseworthy. The God of peace will never leave us or forsake us. If there's anything I would leave with you, Dad, is to keep always encouraging your children to find in Jesus Christ their hope so that when their hand slips from yours, 
it naturally falls into the hand of Jesus. So that when they leave your house, they find a home in Christ. And when they begin to establish their own home, they take that which you have helped them to discover about God, that which they've learned from walking with God on their own, and they begin to pass that on to their children so that their children come to know the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's to be done in gentleness. It's to be done with great hope. And most of all, love your children. They're the most precious things in the world. Mr. Williams, when we were in scout troops, said to his son, Jack, get over here, give me a kiss, good night. We're in scout troop. Dad, so what's your problem? He said, I kissed my father all the time until I got into the service. Teach your children how to love by modeling that love so they can see that if nothing else, they are precious to God, and they're precious to you. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Love, Heavenly Father, that you have given to us is vast as an ocean. It overflows into our life like a mighty river, a current of cannot be stopped. So many times, Heavenly Father, our hearts have been broken by your love, which constantly applies grace upon grace upon grace. Help us, Heavenly Father, not only to be recipients of it, but in every way, shape, form. Help us to pour love into your children. Lord, whether they be our own children or they be children who look to us because they have seen your grace in our lives. If, Heavenly Father, you're calling us to a spiritual fatherhood where we are to adopt someone as we have been adopted, that child, boy, girl, help us to show them the values of the world in which we live in, the values that you have come to call us to in Christ Jesus so that they may see Christ living in us, the hope of glory. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.